My God is merciful and mighty I have forgiveness by His blood And even though my sins are many My God remembers them no more Jesus, the holy son of David You are the way, the truth, the life You know sin, but you be By the cross I'm justified I'm a child of the one true king My only hope is Christ in me This is this song my heart will see Oh, I'm found in But now alive in you Your resurrection is my story Oh, by faith I stand to prove Oh, I'm a child of the one true King My only home is Christ in me He sees this song my heart will sing Oh I am found in you My past cannot pursue me My sins are washed away Your goodness and your mercy will follow all my deeds my past cannot pursue me my sins are washed away your goodness and your mercy will follow all my deeds my past cannot pursue me my sins are washed away your goodness and your mercy will follow all my days my past cannot pursue me my sins are washed away your goodness and your mercy will follow all my days all my days i'm a child My only hope is Christ in me. This is this song my heart will sing. Oh, I am found in you. I'm a child of the one true King. My only hope. This song my heart will sing Oh, I am found in you Oh, I am found in you Well, you don't need to look very far or think very hard about how this last five, six weeks have been very challenging. Some parents have been thrown into homeschooling overnight. Um, we all have to figure out how we're going to navigate getting our groceries. Um, and our day-to-day -day, uh, routine has really been shaken up. Uh, well, while this seems very challenging and sometimes overwhelming, it also has provided us a very unique opportunity. 
an opportunity for our families to grow with each other, uh, to really live life together, and an opportunity for the Christian to really foster a relationship with Jesus. This morning, I'd like to turn our attention to a psalm. It's a psalm of David. Uh, it's Psalm 139, verses 23 to 24, and I'd like to encourage you to turn to that now. Uh, so I'll read this to us out loud. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Although our current situation is very difficult, uh, we will never have so much time on our hands. Time, like I said before, spent with our family, but also time to spend with the Lord. Time spent in prayer and worship and reading and meditating and studying his word. Uh, and this passage really grasps what I would like to present today, that we ask the Lord to search our hearts, to see if there's anything in there that he's not pleased with, to reveal that in us and for us to repent of that. Um, and last but not least, David says, and lead me in the way everlasting. That's to fully embrace the gospel and to walk in obedience according to his perfect will. This is such an earnest and a great thing to seek after. So I want to encourage us all to do this. This next song that we're about to sing um, echoes this psalm so strongly. So let's pray together um, and we'll continue to worship. Lord, thank you for your perfect will. Thank you for this situation we're in, even though it's so difficult, Lord. I pray that we will hold fast to you and to your truth. Lord, I thank you for your protection in our lives and your provision for all of our needs. And Lord, I pray that you give us a desire to take this opportunity to grow our relationships. Lord, that we can spend time with our family and love them. And Lord, most importantly, that we can spend intentional time with you, reading and praying and singing. And Lord, I pray that inside of that, you'll reveal things in our heart that are not pleasing to you. And Lord, I pray that we ask for forgiveness and that we repent of those things. And Lord, that we hold fast to you and your grace and your truth. King Jesus, we truly love you and we ask all of this in your sweet and holy name. Amen. Let's continue to sing. In the secret place Where I see your face Will you take me there again? Search my heart in the deepest part from beginning to the end to you my eyes are lifting to you my prayer is rising up you've captured my attention consume me consume me God give me a heart of ever after you alone gold and silver Like Jericho, come and tear down my walls. I am in your hands, you are the promised land, you're the king of my heart. Let's sing together to you, my eyes are lifting. To No 
song You've captured my attention Consume me Consume me, God Give me a heart abandoned Ever after you alone Gold and silver You can take it All I want is you When I've been the fool And I hid from you Used to call out my name When my flesh is weak Will you help me see You are all that I need You are all that I need Good morning, and thank you for joining our online service today. The world has changed dramatically, and the way we do life is so different, but there are a few things that have stayed the same, and one of those is our staff is still meeting on Wednesdays through Zoom, and we are still praying for you. Our elders are also getting prayer requests, and they are praying throughout the week. We really want to know how we can be praying for you and your family specifically. So we'd like to invite you to send any prayer requests you have or any needs or questions on how to connect during this time. Send us an email to connect at gracechurchinfo.net. Again, that's the word connect at gracechurchinfo.net. Thank you. Good morning, Grace Church. It's time to open up our Bibles, so if you will grab yours, we're going to be reading in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 17 this morning. If um, Kids, if you're in the room with your parents, get up on the couch, snuggle up in their laps, open up your Bibles, and let's read the Word together. Well, again, we are in 2 Timothy chapter 3. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people, for among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. Just as Janes and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, 
while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with, this, acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Will you please pray with us? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to open your word together, Lord. And we ask that you uh, would uh, empower Paul as he goes through this passage uh, to teach us on this. And Lord, we again are just thankful for that. We ask that you uh, open our minds and our hearts as we uh, are led through this passage today. And we continue to pray for our church, our families, our neighbors, our friends, as we all go through this difficult time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Well, I was talking to a person this week who lost their job recently and uh, is quite concerned about that. They're uh, able to take unemployment benefits for now, but they're wondering what things are going to be looking like in the days ahead when those benefits run dry. And they're doing their best to trust the Lord and depend on him and believe that he's going to provide for them but I was thinking as I was talking to this person that it sure would be great if God would just tell them what it is that he had in mind and what it is that he was going to do and why it was that this person found themselves in the situation that they were in. Our topic this morning as we continue in our base camp series is that God speaks and I want to start by asking you this morning, how many times in your life have you wished that God would speak out loud to you and to tell you why something in your life is happening or what you ought to do, how you should uh, prepare, or, or even that he would just assure you that, that he was still there for you, that, that he was still in charge, that his grace and his love towards you was still in operation. Now, wouldn't it be great if God would speak to you? And this morning, I want to tackle the subject of, because does God still do that? Does God speak today? And what I want to do is just to cut to the chase and to give you the answer that the Bible gives to that question. Does God still speak? The Bible's answer is yes. And it's a yes that's double underlined. And it's got two exclamation points at the end and it's circled with green magic marker. The Bible tells us that God absolutely still speaks today. That he speaks clearly and powerfully through his word in the Bible. So that if you've ever read this book, you have heard the voice of God speaking to you. Now, uh, raise your hand if you feel just a little bit disappointed by that answer. Okay, you'll notice that my hand is up to, uh, to be honest, the idea that God speaks through the Bible can feel a little bit dissatisfying. 
And, and the reason is, is because there's been many times in my life when I've wished that God would speak not generally to me through the Bible, but specifically to me audibly, out loud, so that I could hear him. And yet it would seem that, well, it's possible for God to speak audibly to a person today. And since he is God, he can choose to do that. He can do anything that he wants to do. And he may actually do that at times for people. It would seem, in spite of that, that God's usual way of speaking to people is through the Bible. And what I hope to convince you of today is that that really is better by far. So why is it that God speaks through the Bible? Why doesn't he choose to just speak directly to me? Well, I was thinking that that sounds like a great idea until you stop to think about it. The problem is that if, if instead of using the Bible, God were just to speak audibly to me, to be fair, he would have to speak audibly to everyone else in the world, too. And that is six billion people. There's a lot of individual conversations that God would have to have, and that would start to get a little bit unwieldy. Because we have to ask the question, what is it that God would say to each individual person? Would he tell us all the same thing, or would he be willing to answer the unique questions that, that each person might want to ask him? And if so, which questions would he deem to be important enough to give a verbal answer to? Would they just be spiritual questions, or would he tell us who we should marry, or, or which job we should take? We'd have to ask the question of how often God would speak to us. Would he speak to us audibly once a year or once a week, uh, maybe just on Sunday afternoons? Or could we count on God to answer all of our questions, kind of like uh, Alexa? And if God did speak individually to everybody, what would happen if two different people differed on their report of what God had said. How would we know which person to believe? And what would stop people from just making stuff up? Uh, that already happens today. There are some TV preachers who do that all the time. And I have to be careful as I say that because I realize in this moment I kind of am a TV preacher, which is a, a very scary thought. But the thing is, if God spoke to each of us, then the only person that we could trust to accurately report on what he had said would be ourselves. But there's even a problem with that because sometimes even our own perceptions are wrong. We can tend to forget things or to exaggerate things over time. All that I'm trying to say is that if God spoke audibly to everyone in the world, what a confusing, muddled mess that would be. But think about this for, for just a minute. Let's say that you had a very important message that you wanted to communicate, not to the whole world, not to six billion people, but just to 10 people. What is it that you would do? Well, I would guess that what you would probably do is you would send out an email. And you'd send an email because you would know that everyone was going to get exactly the same message at exactly the same time. And not only that, but that the message would be documented. Nobody could claim that you had said something different because there's the email right there. You, you have a clear accurate, authoritative record of what your message actually was. It's clean and it's simple and either one week later or 50 years later, it still says exactly the same thing. And this is what the Bible is like. God has an important message for the human race to, to every person who has ever lived and if you want to get an important message to every tribe and to every tongue and to every nation throughout every age in history, the best 
and most logical and loving thing to do is to take that message and to write it down. And that's what we've been given in the Bible. And what 2 Timothy chapter 3, which was just read for us, is meant to show us is at least three things about how God speaks through the Bible. It, it shows us, first of all, what the Bible is for, second of all, who the Bible is from, and third of all, how the Bible is meant to impact our lives. So why don't we take a look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. What you have in this chapter is kind of an interesting contrast between those who have uh, heard and accepted God's message through his word in the Bible and those who haven't. And God begins, Paul begins by, by describing in this passage those who haven't. He says that during the last days, which are the times that we are living in now, there are going to come very uh, difficult problems. And, and these difficulties will be a result of the character of the people who live during these days. Look at verses 1 through 8. Paul writes, But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all as it was to those two men. And I think you can summarize the kind of people that are being talked about here at the beginning of verse 2, where it says that they are not lovers of God. And then at the end of verse 4, which, oh, I'm sorry, jump back. It says at the beginning of verse 2 that they are lovers of self. And in verse 4, that they are not lovers of God. And this love of self and dislove of God seems to create the kind of people who this list exemplifies. Ungrateful people, proud people, not loving, swollen with conceit, heartless, and the list goes on. And Paul, in this passage, his exhibit A of this kind of person is uh, two men whose names are Janus and Jambres, who he says opposed Moses. Now these guys are not mentioned any other place in the Bible, but in Jewish tradition, it was believed that these two men were the chief magicians of Pharaoh during the time of the Exodus. And if you remember the story, God worked miraculous signs during the plagues uh, through Moses. And Pharaoh had some magicians who tried to duplicate these marvelous works. And they were defiant against God. The magicians wanted to do the things that God could do, but they didn't give two hoots about God himself. And Paul says these people were corrupt and opposed to God. They were against him. But Paul says in verse 9 that just like these two chief magicians were exposed to be frauds in the end. He says, so will everyone else who lives like this. Paul warns that the, the godlessness that exists in the last days is a dead end. And then he brings about a contrast. Paul introduces a person who exemplifies a, a different way of living. And he points to Timothy himself, whom this letter is written to. 
He says in, in verse 10, You, however, Timothy, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. So there was something different about Timothy. And that is that Timothy had followed a different kind of teaching, which had led to a different kind of lifestyle and that had produced uh, the sort of character that protected Timothy, not only from becoming the kind of godless person that is described in the verses ahead, but also from meeting the same kind of outcome, that dead end that this godlessness leads to. And the question that the passage seeks to answer is where did this teaching that Timothy had learned originate? And Paul answers that question in verses 14 through 17. He says, but as for you, Timothy, Continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So what Paul is getting at here is that one of the big reasons why Timothy is different, why there's such a contrast in him, he says, is because he has learned and firmly believed the scriptures. And I wanna take just a minute and, and make sure that we understand what that means and what it is that the scriptures actually are. Uh, the word scripture is used in the New Testament in the Bible uh, 51 times. And every single time that word scripture is used, it's used in reference to a different part of the Bible. Sometimes the word scripture is used to refer to the entire Old Testament. And sometimes it's just used to refer to parts of the Old Testament. Sometimes the word scripture is used to refer to a large section of the New Testament and other times just a smaller specific part of the New Testament. But, but the Bible uses the word scripture or sacred writings, which is another phrase that's in this passage, to identify itself. The scriptures the Bible would teach is all of the teaching that is found in the Bible. Now, the Bible is such an interesting book because it's like a, a, a great library that's composed of 66 books. 39 of those books are found in the Old Testament and 27 of them make up the New Testament. But, but the entire Bible, all 66 books, was written over the course of 1,500 years. And it was written by more than 40 authors who all had different experiences and cultures and backgrounds. And it was written in three different languages and it spanned three different continents. And in that way, the Bible is an incredibly diverse book. But Paul tells us here something that is truly amazing about the Bible. And that is, he says, that the Bible, even though it's this great, big, vast book, he says it has one main purpose. And the main purpose he gives us is in verse 15. He says that the sacred writings, the scripture, the Bible, is able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. That's Paul's summary of what the Bible is all about, that it is a book that was written to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul is talking about all of it. That's the big idea of what the Bible is all about. You know, many people don't realize this, but the Bible is not just a bunch of disconnected writings on rules and, and history lessons. 
Instead, the Bible is one great, big, sweeping, epic story. And what the Old Testament does is it lays down the foundation of the story. It, it introduces the plot. Uh, the Old Testament describes for us God's creation of this world and of people and mankind's betrayal of our creator. And, and through story after story and person after person, what we see is our inability to resolve the problems that mankind have created. And in fact, the hole that we keep digging gets bigger and bigger. Now, the Old Testament centers around God's interaction with a particular group of people, which was the nation of Israel. And through their story, what we're meant to do is to begin to understand the kind of character and power and love and, and holiness that God has, but, but also in so many different shapes and forms, the failure of Israel to respond to all of those things. The story of the Old Testament makes it crystal clear that there is something that is fundamentally flawed inside the hearts of, of human beings. And, and what the Old Testament does is, is it not only reveals those flaws, but it also shows us our need for outside help to address those flaws. And the Old Testament predicts and promises that that help is coming. We can't solve all of our own problems, but God will send someone to rescue us. The Old Testament promises and prepares us for a Messiah, someone who will redeem us back to God, who will make things right again. And then in the New Testament, that very Savior is revealed to be Jesus Christ himself. And we are told the story of his perfect life and his sacrificial death on the cross and of his glorious resurrection, which we are told will lead to the restoration of everything that has been so terribly broken and, and damaged and destroyed. And we are given a, a picture of God's future kingdom, which is promised to be an eternal home for all of those who trust in Christ by faith. And so the New Testament not only uh, tells us the, the, the uh, story of, of what's coming behind our future destiny, but it, it gives us the implications of how we ought to live in light of that today and who we ought to be and what we ought to trust and the kind of faith that we ought to have in light of what Jesus has done. So the Bible, the, the scripture is one great, big, diverse, and yet incredibly unified, sweeping story of God's creation and redemption of mankind. And when you read it, what you begin to see is that what Paul says here is exactly true. The entire Bible centers around Jesus. That's why what Paul can say here is that what the Bible is for is it's meant to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And that's what had happened to Timothy. After learning the, the scriptures, he had recognized his own need for salvation in Christ and, and put his faith in him. And, and this set him on a course in contrast to the, the godlessness of the first part of the chapter. Rather than simply being a lover of self and not a lover of God, Timothy was becoming more and more a lover of God and, and not of self. It's like God was using his word to, to make a shift in Timothy's life. And that's what God's word is designed to produce in each one of us. God's word is designed to make us wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. But the next thing that this passage answers for us is not just what the Bible is for, but who the Bible is from. Look at verse 16. 
Paul writes, all scripture is breathed out by God. Let's just uh, stop right there. Uh, That in itself is an incredible statement. What it means is that even though the Bible was written by all of those human authors over all of that time, 1,500 years, we are told that its message was breathed out or that it was inspired or directed by God himself. Uh, The other day, uh, I took the kids outside to fly a kite. Uh, We had been given a kite, and they were very excited to fly it. So we brought it outside, put it together, and unfortunately, it did not go well. The kids were very disappointed. And the problem was that there just wasn't enough wind. Everybody was so excited to fly the kite that we tried to do it without any wind. And the kite kept crashing through the ground, to the ground, and... Um, what the truth is in that is that, that, that you can have the best kite in the world, but if you don't have any wind beneath that kite, you are totally out of luck. And, and the inspiration of Scripture is a bit like that. Uh, the various authors of the Bible were like kites, but, but God himself was the wind, and as they wrote the Bible, he was the invisible power that was guiding and directing and en- enabling them to soar. God used the authors of the Bible to write his message. Now, that doesn't mean that God dictated every word of the Bible to them. Sometimes he does do that, but, but often not. What we are told is that God inspired every word of his book. Uh, There's a theologian named Wayne Grudem who describes it this way. I, I thought this was somewhat helpful. God's providential oversight and direction of the life of each author was such that their personalities, their backgrounds and training, their ability to evaluate events in the world around them, their access to historical data, their judgment with regard to the accuracy of information and their individual circumstances when they wrote were all exactly what God wanted them to be. So that when they actually came to the point of putting pen to paper, the words were fully their own words, but also fully the words that God wanted them to write, words that God himself would claim as his own. And we believe that not only was God responsible for inspiring the Bible, but but God has also maintained the integrity of the Bible over time. We believe that, that God has quietly been at work like that steady wind throughout the ages of history, supernaturally preserving the authenticity and accuracy of the Bible that it was him who sovereignly oversaw all of the thousands of manuscripts of the Bible that have been meticulously copied throughout hundreds of years, that that he was quietly directing the careful research and even the debate of, of church councils who were choosing to decide what to include and not what and what not to include as far as certain books go in the Bible. And what God's supernatural inspiration and protection of Scripture means is that you and I can trust that the book that we are holding in our hands is God's actual message to us. The Bible is not a a normal book. It, It didn't come to us just accidentally or by luck, we believe that God supervised the entire process. And that's why Christians can trust that the scripture is the final authority of our lives. We believe that it is authoritative for us because we believe that it's actually God's message to us. That he himself is actually speaking to us through the words that are written on this page. Christians believe that God wrote us a book 
And it's why we can confidently say that, that if you want to hear the voice of God speaking to you, all you need to do is read his book. Well, finally, Paul uh, tells us then the value that the Bible has in our lives. Look again at verses 16 and then 17. He writes, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Paul says that the Bible is profitable for at least four things. The first thing he says is that it's profitable for teaching. And that means that it tells us the things that are good for us and those truths in life that we need to know. He says it's profitable for reproof, which is like the flip side of, preach, of teaching. Uh, reproof means that it's also able to reveal for us the ways that we are walking in error. It's like the Bible shines a light into the dark corners of our lives. He says it's profitable in correcting us, and, and that is when we fall off track, the Bible is able to help us steer back into the right direction. And finally, he says it's profitable for training in righteousness. We, we learn how it is that we can please God. The Bible is not presented as an old, crusty, out-of-date book. But Paul's opinion was that, that it was like our training manual. It's like a chest full of treasures for this life and the next. And finally, he says, its purpose is to make us complete and equipped for every good work. That's what God wants to use his word to do in our lives. Yesterday, I was uh, at the house and starting to get a little bit stir crazy, and I didn't have any place to go, so I told the kids that we could get in the car and go for a drive, and we would play a game called Backseat Driver. And the way that it worked was basically, I was just gonna drive straight ahead, and whenever they told me to turn, I would turn no matter what. And that's what we did for about an hour. We, we just drove around wherever they wanted to go and, and, and they would direct it. And I was kind of surprised by how much they loved that simple game. I, I, I could tell that they were really enjoying it and that they had this sense of, of power. I, I was letting my kids be in charge. Now, if you were to ask me who is in charge of my life, I would tell you that God is. I would tell you that I believe with all my heart that he's driving the car and I'm in the back seat. I believe that God is sovereign. I believe that he's in control of all things. I believe that he loves me. I believe that he desires good for me. And I believe that I can trust him to steer my life in the right direction. But even though I know those things are true in my head, in my heart, I have to say that sometimes I really struggle to be in the back seat. There is something inside of me that so badly wants to drive the car. I want to be in charge of my own life. I want the power to choose in my life exactly where it is that, that I'm heading. I, I want to know what's going to happen or at least where it is that I'm going. And that's partly why I want so badly for God to answer all of my questions. That there is a part of me that wants God to speak out loud and tell me the answer to those things that are uncertain to me. And the reason is because I feel out of control. It, it, it frustrates me at times that God isn't answering my questions. I feel at times like I'm stuck in the back seat and, and God is just driving quietly. And I tell him that I want him to turn and he doesn't. And I'm not sure where he's heading and I'm not sure where things are going. 
And yet, what 2 Timothy chapter 3 tells us is that even though God isn't necessarily always answering our specific questions in life, this passage tells us that God is never silent. You know, there's really two ways that a person can read the Bible. The first way is to approach it with their own agenda. And, and I've certainly been guilty of this before. It's having a specific question or concern in mind and kind of flipping open the Bible and hoping that I'll read something that will, that will speak to exactly that in the moment or feeling a certain kind of feeling that I don't like and hoping I can just flip the Bible open and God will give me something that will make me feel good or better, almost like taking a, a, a pill. But I've found over the years that often God doesn't respond to that. Often I'll open up my Bible and not see anything helpful or feel anything different. Because the, the thing is, when we come to read the Bible, we still don't get to be in charge. What 2 Timothy 3 tells us is that God has a certain agenda for us when it comes to using his word in our lives. He has certain aims that he's seeking to accomplish and, and to use the Bible to produce in us. He has deep work that he wants to do inside of us. And sometimes when we come to the Bible, those things are totally off of our radar. When we come to read the Bible, God is always speaking to us from the driver's seat, and we are the passengers. And I really believe that when we get up in the morning and we pour ourselves a cup of coffee and, and open up his book, we are meant to have an attitude that says, okay, God, where is it that you want to take me? Where is it that you want me to go? What do you want to show me today? How do you want me to learn from you today? Is there a command here that you want me to obey? Is there an example that I'm about to read that you want me to follow? Is there a promise here that you want me to claim as my own or a sin that you want me to avoid? Is there a principle that you want me to follow today as I read this? And how does what I'm about to read point me to faith in Jesus? How are you seeking to teach or to correct or reprove or train me? 2 Timothy chapter 2 tells us that God's aim through the voice of his word is not primarily to answer all of our questions, but that it's something much richer that God wants to use his word to make us wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. That he wants to use his word to slowly transform us from being lovers of self to being lovers of God. And that God wants to use this book to make us complete and equipped for every good work in life. And as we bring our lives to God's word, usually over the course of, of weeks more than days and months more than just weeks, as we listen faithfully over time, what we find is that God speaks using his word powerfully into our lives. I don't know who said it, but I think there is a tremendous amount of wisdom in this statement. Never say God is silent if your Bible is closed. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you this morning that you are not limited by what I think I need for myself each day. You are not limited in just speaking to the questions that I'm asking but that for me and for each of us, you have deep purposes in our lives. Father, there are things that we ought to see about ourselves, but don't. And you use your word to illuminate those things in us. 
Father, there are ways that our faith is weak that you desire to use your word to build up and to produce something different. Father, there are ways that you desire your word to equip us and to prepare us for every good work. Father, help us to value the scriptures more than we do. Help us to uh, believe with all of our hearts that, that these words are yours to us. And we pray that you would give us a deep dependence upon your word. We pray that you would help uh, us in the ways that we need to uh, produce the kind of disciplines in our lives so that we are willing and desirous to come and to hear your voice through your word. We pray that as we do that, that you would help us more and more to understand it and to recognize how the Bible points to our need for Jesus and, and, and how through faith in him we are transformed and changed. And we thank you that you have not left the human race to wander on their own and to figure things out, but you have spoken to us. May we listen faithfully to your voice. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. There was a moment when the lights went out When death has claimed its victory The king of love had given up his life darkest day in history there on a cross they made for sinners for every curse his blood atoned one final breath and it was finished but not the end we could have known for the earth began to shake And the veil was torn The sacrifice was made As the heavens roared Oh, hell, King Confess 
say he is Lord. Lift up your shout. Let us join with all of heaven singing. Holy. It's singing holy. And cry. Good morning, Grace Church. Thank you so much for choosing to worship with us this morning. We're going to move into a time of giving together. If you call Grace Church your home, this is a regular part of our act of worship together. In moments such as this, in this specific moment, I have never been so encouraged by how Christians have chosen to continue to give towards the needs of others. I've heard countless stories about people uh, reaching out to help their neighbor or to go shopping for those in need or even helping financially, uh, not only to the churches in the area, but to the specific people in their lives. It's been incredibly encouraging to witness. A passage that comes to mind is Hebrews chapter 13, verse 16. It says this, And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. You see, God desires that his people would be marked by giving, especially in moments like this. And so I want to encourage you as we give this morning as a church, that this would be our mark, a mark of giving, a mark of uh, giving grace because of the great grace which we have received. Here at Grace Church, you can give several ways. Uh, the first is by giving online at gracechurchinfo.net. The second is by giving through text message at the number found on the bottom of the screen. And the third is by mailing in a check to our address. We just want to thank you so much for partnering with us to meet the needs of those overseas, those in our community, and by helping us share the gospel with those around us. Let's pray over the offering. Father God, thank you so much that we have the opportunity to be a light to our community. God, I pray that these gifts that are given would be used for your purpose and that we as believers in moments like this would be marked by um, uh, hearts of giving and that your gospel would be um, spread and known throughout our community and to the ends of the earth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, just the other day, my three-year-old daughter said to me, Dad, when the coronavirus is over, will you be glad to see everybody? And she had a big smile on her face, and I thought to myself, yes, I will be so glad to see everyone when this is over. I think I speak for everyone when I say how much I have missed uh, seeing not only my extended family, but uh, many of the people that I love who are a part of the church. In fact, I should say every person who's a part of the church, not, not uh, just many. I don't want to leave anybody out. But I think it's one of the most difficult things that we have faced is just our disconnection from other people. And many of the community groups that exist in our church are still meeting over Zoom. But I wanted to give an invitation to anyone who is not a part of one of those groups to consider joining with us in a new, kind of a temporary group that will uh, happen over Zoom. If you think that you might be interested in participating in something like that for a time, please contact us and let us know and we'll get a hold of you with some more information about that to see if that might be a good fit for you. But we certainly need each other for encouragement and support and prayer as uh, we all seek to move through these challenging times. 
Well, as we close our service today, I want to read the familiar words from the doxology in the book of Jude. And so I'd invite you just to bow your heads and as I read these to reflect on these wonderful promises. It says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.